Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are finally here, and it doesn't feel even a little bit good to say, I told you so. At the end of my Legends Arceus video, I said that Game Freak was releasing games too fast and that Scarlet and Violet would be rushed. Honestly, I'd love to see anyone disagree with that take, because they would be wrong. Listen, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's just get into it. Full disclosure, I'll be spoiling a lot in this video, like endgame Pokemon and areas, but I'll put a spoiler warning in front of any major story spoilers in case someone is still holding out two weeks after release somehow. I'll divide my review into three appropriately named parts themed after a particular western film. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I hope you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let's begin with the good, because honestly, there's a lot of it here. This is our first truly open world Pokemon game, and that rules. Being able to traverse a massive world and find Pokemon that follow you around curiously, or finding a hidden cave with new Pokemon is super interesting. A big part of this game is the new Let's Go mechanic, which allows you to send out your lead Pokemon to fight others or pick up items. When you defeat Pokemon like this, they drop reduced XP, but also drop resources used to craft TMs at any Pokemon Center. I really like this because it adds more incentive to adventuring around and catching new Pokemon, while not taking too long to grind. I think they struck the balance of resource drops almost perfectly, and watching your little fella run around and commit genocide is pretty fun. Not only that, but every trainer battle outside of the story is completely optional, which is a great change. I probably fought less than 20 trainers all game because I just wanted to fill out the Pokédex. They give a lot of XP, but to me it always feels like mandatory trainers slow down the game, so I love this change. Speaking of story battles, this game has an actually okay story, which is amazing for a Pokémon game. In fact, it has three. These are the Victory Road, which is your usual gym battles and Elite Four involving your rival Nimona. She's... fine. Not the worst rival by a long shot, but I do worry that the younger generations playing this game might develop an attraction to tall, tan tomboys, which would be really unfortunate because that means it's harder for me to date one. There's the Path of Legends, which involves you and your friend Arvin searching for Titan Pokemon, which eventually culminates in a big boss battle with said Titan. While these aren't super interesting, Arvin's motivation for why he's doing this is actually really sweet, and makes me genuinely invested in this storyline. Finally, our third story is Starfall Street. This involves a group of renegade students known as Team Star. Again, nothing particularly special, mostly just a series of boss battles after short Let's Go segments, but again, has an actually intriguing story. This team isn't really doing anything bad, similar to other recent teams, but the students have all left school due to bullying. There's honestly some really heartfelt dialogue here, especially in the final battle. I really like it, and it keeps me quite invested. At the end of all three storylines, they converge into a final short segment taking place in the Great Crater of Paldea, home to a new type of Pokémon called Paradox Pokémon. For Pokémon Violet, these will be futuristic forms, and for Scarlet, these will be ancient forms. After reaching the bottom, we face off with one of the coolest in-game fights in Pokémon, at least in my opinion. Mystery is built up pretty well, and there's a twist at the end that I didn't see coming. This is probably the best ending to a Pokemon game since Black and White, which is awesome. Now I'm going to go a little bit more in depth, so if you're trying to avoid spoilers, hop to here in the video. So if you're still listening, I assume that you're fine with spoiling the end. So basically, the professor is trapped in the Great Crater of Paldea, but something is clearly wrong. Eventually, you discover that the professor created a time machine, which is what is transporting Pokémon into our time. Finally reaching the bottom, it turns out that the professor you've been talking to is actually an AI created by the previous professor, who died in a Pokémon attack years ago. However, it's realized that the Paradox Pokémon are terrible for the ecosystem, and has decided to destroy the professor's dream. It can't do it itself, since it's part of the protection system, so when you decide to shut it down, the final fight is against the AI itself. And holy fuck is it cool. This arena is so fucking awesome, the time machine drops master balls right into the professor's hand and the whole time it taunts you. Not only that, but this fight has the new best song in the whole series. 
Well, except maybe for Heavenly Kings. This is how you end a Pokemon game. This fucking rules. Just the idea that there's not really a villain, or if there is, I guess it's the old professor, and they're long dead. So the real villain is like the time machine, I guess, but they were just trying to complete their dreams. They weren't actually trying to be evil. It's a really big gray area, and I think it's really interesting, especially the idea that the AI they built themselves, built after themselves with their own thoughts and memories, eventually decided to destroy their own dream. That's such a cool idea, I think it's actually really good. Finally, after a shorter, more scripted fight against the legendary, there's a really heartwarming scene of you and your friends. I really adore this ending, and I just wanted to talk about it for a bit because I think this level of story should be expected from Pokemon. It's cool and fun and has a few twists I didn't see coming. It's pretty sick. Anyway, let's get back to the spoiler-free zone now. There's not really a post-game, unfortunately. You can re-challenge the gyms and do a nice little tournament, but that's about it story-wise. Of course we have Terra Raids as well, which help to fill that gap, even though you can do these at any point, so it's not really a post-game. The Max Raid Adventures in Sword and Shield were my favorite part of those games, even though the raids themselves were a bit lacking and time-consuming. In Scarlet and Violet, they drastically improved this formula by making players move at the same time, significantly reducing the time each raid takes as well as making the raid rewards extraordinary, including ingredients needed to make shiny chance boosting sandwiches. Overall, the gameplay has also been sped up considerably in general. From nearly the very start of the game, you have access to your ride Pokemon, and as you play through the Path of Legends, you get more mobility options like climbing or gliding. Since all Pokemon are visible on the overworld, encountering the ones you really want or finding shinies is a lot easier if you know what you're looking for. Since pretty much the whole world is open to you from the very start, you can catch a variety of Pokemon really quickly or look around for good items. Unfortunately, one of my major complaints is that the gyms don't scale with the number of gym badges you have, so there's still kind of a set order to doing it, or at least a recommended order, and I really don't like that, I don't know why you can't just go in any order you want. I get that wild Pokemon being a higher level makes sense in later areas of the game, but if I want to go do the quote-unquote 8th badge first, why isn't that allowed? I don't think that it would be that difficult to make a team for each gym leader and scale up levels for each gym badge that you have. Just change the number of Pokemon in their team slightly and change their levels and moves, it shouldn't be that hard and I think it would be a big improvement. But overall, it's still okay. This region's gimmick is Terrastalization, which allows your Pokemon to transform into a single type, which can be anything. It's really interesting, and although I didn't use it a ton in the main story, it's really useful for raid battles and I'm excited to see it in competitive games. Speaking of competitive, there's multiplayer! Like, real, actual multiplayer. Up to three other players can join a host's world, all able to explore the map and progress their own stories. This is absolutely fantastic. It's fun to show off new Pokemon to your friends and hear their gasps and what the fuck is that? Or throw out a shiny and brag to them. You can make sandwiches together and share the buffs that they give. Your whole crew can shiny hunt together. This is an incredible choice, and it works pretty darn well. If friends with different versions of the game join each other, Pokemon from both games spawn with a slightly lower rate, meaning that you don't need to spam trades to finish the Pokédex. Just join someone with a different copy and start adventuring. That is, if you can find anyone with a copy of Scarlet. I'm pretty sure they're only spoken of in Ancient Legends, so good luck. But this is really good overall. I honestly hope multiplayer remains a staple of Pokemon games for the future because it's extremely fun. Finally, let's talk about the music. Is it any surprise at all that the Pokemon music fucking rules? Game Freak got Toby Fox to do a ton of the tracks for these games, and as always, it's absolutely incredible. The overworld has a unique theme for each zone, and a lot of them feature very prominent guitar, creating an upbeat and relaxed feel, which I think works really well for exploring this huge world at your own pace. 
The battles, on the other hand, have a very jazz band kind of feel, utilizing a lot of brass stings with trumpets and percussion, which almost sounds like someone clapping along to the beat. The Team Star battle theme is an absolute banger, a super intense mix of electric guitar and a ton of loud percussion creating an amazing rock song cut up by upbeat synth melodies and backed up by a heavily distorted vocal. It absolutely fits the mood, and I love it. Finally, Area Zero has an almost futuristic air to it. Chimes and synths play entrancing repetitive melodies while a heavy loud bass backs it up and stings that sound like gears turning or steam escaping along with a choir of people sing along in the background. It sounds almost like something out of the Nier series, which is absolutely beautiful in this bright, mysterious area. This finally culminates in the final battle, which I briefly mentioned in my spoiler area earlier, and while I won't say what happens there, I will say that it's my new favorite song in the series. It's a high-intensity, fast-paced banger of a theme, and gives me goosebumps every time I hear it. It fits this scenario perfectly, and I fucking adore it. The breaks in this song have an almost melancholy feeling, with the song slowing to make way for a sad melody played on electric guitar before kicking back into gear, almost like driving you forward no matter what you think of the situation. What a masterpiece. I've probably gushed long enough, so just listen to the music while you're playing. It's worth it. In general, the game is fantastic. It's the same timeless Pokemon formula with an amazing open world, three converging storylines that are all decently different, but actually engaging for a change. Really interesting new Pokemon designs and a generally faster formula overall, a cool new mechanic that changes the entire game, and just generally fun. It's really enjoyable. And if the review ended here, I would honestly be overjoyed. In fact, if I could say the game was two steps forward and one step back, I would still be happy. But unfortunately, I think the idea of one step forward and one step back is more appropriate because it's time to move on to the bad. Let's step back to Legends Arceus for a second. One thing everyone seemed to love about the game was the overworld catching, significantly speeding up the time to catch Pokemon because you almost never needed to engage in an actual battle with them. You could just hide in the grass and chuck balls. So naturally, in Scarlet and Violet, this is removed. It's, it's just gone, and I don't know why. I understand that Legends encourage the player to catch a lot of the same Pokemon to fill out the Pokédex, so it makes sense to speed up the catching process. You don't need to do this in SV, but if I'm trying to hunt for a Hoppip with a specific nature, I need to engage and catch and check each of those separately instead of just catching 30 of them on the overworld and checking their stats afterwards. It's not a massive deal, but it's really annoying. Legends made this mechanic feel so good, where you can catch Pokemon off guard and easily capture them quickly. I felt like I was really catching wild Pokemon, and now I can see them in the overworld. I can catch them off guard by backstriking them, just like in Legends, but it just gives me a free turn in battle instead. Why not just add overworld catching too? We have enough buttons on the controller for it, again, it doesn't ruin the game, but I think it would strictly be an improvement. Next, let's discuss the introduction to the game. The first two hours, basically nothing happens. You're trapped spamming through dialogue or slowly following NPCs. I appreciate that overall the game allows a lot more freedom than something like Sword and Shield, which barely let you walk two steps without someone telling you where to go next. Once you're past this intro sequence, the hand-holding basically disappears, but wow, this intro sequence drags. I just wanted to run around in the open world, not listen to that text box ding for an hour straight. Again, overall this isn't the worst, but I really wish they shortened this segment down. Also, to the disappointment of Nuzlockers everywhere, set battle mode is gone. It's just gone. If you're unfamiliar, the regular way Pokemon is played in the games is to see what Pokemon your opponent is using next, and the opportunity to change with them. In competitive, and frequently in challenges like Nuzlocks, players use the set battle mode, which doesn't allow you to switch Pokemon in such a way. This adds an additional layer of strategy, since you'll almost always be switching into an attack if you want to change Pokemon. 
Set mode is still used in online battles, so why isn't it an option for the normal game? And sure, you could give the argument that players can choose to play set by never switching given the opportunity, but that's still a problem. Why would Game Freak remove a future that doesn't affect the average player but is a considerable quality of life improvement for players that want to challenge? It's just strange that the option has been in every single game until now and is suddenly gone. It's really frustrating. Oh, and the animations suck. Remember in Legends when you used a physical move and your Pokemon actually moved to hit the opponent? Not in this one, it just kinda jumps and then a hit effect appears on the other Pokemon. The faces are a lot more expressive on people, but why does the sandwich animation look so pathetic? L like it's terrible! Next time I go on a picnic my main ingredient is gonna be cyanide. It's just kinda pathetic that they couldn't be bothered to animate this. But honestly, that's about it, which is crazy. This game doesn't have much that's bad about it. I think this is one of the better Pokemon experiences. By far the best 3D game we've had in the series. Some minor complaints here and there, but that doesn't ruin the experience. Well, at least nothing in this section does. Now we need to get to the final section. The Ugly. Let's address the Don fan in the room. This game looks like shit and runs like shit. Seriously, I don't think my game ran over 20 FPS the entire time I was playing. If you dash on your ride Pokemon, the game drops frames. If you jump on your ride Pokemon, the game drops frames. And God forbid you walk near a lake during the day. Apparently, looking at a reflection makes the world go into slow motion. Seriously, look at these two clips. On the left, I catch a Pokemon near my level in a starting zone. On the right, I'm catching a Pokemon near my level while surfing on a lake. These are unedited, by the way. I'm going to sync up these clips with the exact frame where the Pokeball leaves my hand. Look at that. Look how much longer the clip on the right takes. What the fuck is this? It's water! It's a reflection of the sun! Why does this tank my frame so fucking bad? And this isn't an uncommon thing. Half the areas in this game run like a PowerPoint slideshow. God forbid it starts snowing near you. Why? Like, honestly, why? What excuse could Game Freak possibly give that would explain this? This game's graphics already suck. We'll talk about that in a bit. There's not that many entities spawning in. The weather effects and reflections are incredibly basic and the pop-in is so short, so why am I playing a series of still images? I know everyone always compares games on the Switch to Breath of the Wild, but that's because it's really good. The game looks amazing and runs perfectly. The only time I noticed a drop in frames is when there's a ton of fire around me, so Game Freak has literally no excuse. There is no reason for the game to run like this. It's disgusting, it's disappointing, and there's rumors going around that a patch will be put out within the next few weeks that fixes the frame rates. But that doesn't fix the problem. I paid $60 for this game on day one. I took off a day of classes and work to enjoy the game. I finished the game in the first five days after release, and the performance was a huge issue during that time. It is absolutely unacceptable for a AAA studio, especially Game Freak and Nintendo, who make games exclusively for their own hardware, to release a game in this state. Why wasn't it delayed? Like seriously, if they put out a patch soon, why the fuck wasn't this game delayed? I would rather wait another year for this game to come out with a fixed frame rate than play this shit. Like I said, this game was clearly rushed. Not only can you tell that from the terrible performance, it's clear in the graphics. Now, don't get me wrong, I think the Pokemon in this game look fantastic. They're actually textured, absolutely incredible. Thank you Game Freak for doing the absolute fucking minimum. On the other hand, the textures of the ground look like someone smeared mud on my camera lens. It's bad. Now, that's not much of a shock, but half the time you can't even see the ground. The cameraman just kinda...
This happens constantly. I can reliably recreate the camera clipping bug almost anywhere on the map just by hatching Pokemon eggs. Not game breaking, of course, but just really annoying and unpolished. And finally, the same issue I've had with Pokemon for the last few years. There's no voice acting. Is anyone surprised? If this was an indie game with a limited budget, I wouldn't mind. If it just had grunts and voiced cutscenes like old 3DS Fire Emblem games, I could forgive it. But really? Nothing? It absolutely ruins the experience. I know voice acting doesn't actually affect the gameplay, but when I'm in the middle of a high-stakes gym battle, my Pokemon is all set up and the gym leader is about to throw out their ace, and they jump in for a second going, ha, we're not done yet, let's go, my strongest, most treasured partner, and all you hear is the text box blips? Like, are you for real? It takes away any amount of excitement. Or how about cutscenes? Why aren't these voiced? Game Freak has created the highest grossing media franchise in the world, of all time, and you're telling me that you can't hire voice actors for the 20 characters that would need to be voiced? Fuck off. At the end of the day, the game is good. The core gameplay and the updates to the way the world and storylines work are fantastic changes. It's fun, and that's what a game should be. The gameplay on its own is incredible. But you would be hard pressed to find anyone with more than four brain cells that says the game would be worse if it had better graphics or voice acting or ran at more than 20 frames a second. It feels like Game Freak is still creating games that are 20 years behind the competition and every problem shows it. I feel like the pride this company once took in this IP is slowly drying up. Never again are we going to see a full national dex. I don't know if they're going to fix the frame rate. Every game is going to have paid DLC from here on out, and only Arceus knows when we'll get voice acting. I'll say it again, we don't need yearly Pokemon releases. We sure as hell don't need two. Nintendo and Game Freak need to slow down and take their time. Give their ideas time to be polished and refined. Time to bring Pokemon to the modern era of video games. I don't ever want to see a game release in this state again because it is unacceptable. I'll be honest with you, I've rewritten this ending segment about six times now and I can't quite get it right. I'm really torn when it comes to these games. When I look at Scarlet and Violet, I see an incredible game, a groundbreaking achievement to the Pokemon formula. A fun and entertaining world that anyone can enjoy, no matter how young or how old. And I also see how much better it could have been with so little effort. A few more months to fix the performance, and a couple thousand dollars to hire voice actors. I truly believe that Scarlet and Violet are the best Pokemon games we've had in the 3D era, and I truly believe that they have some of the worst problems. While Generation 9 has officially become my favorite series of Pokemon games, the disastrous release they had is completely unacceptable and cannot be overlooked. I'll be revisiting these games early next year since there are already rumors of DLC, so we'll see how it goes then, but for now, the only thing that I can express to Game Freak is disappointment. Not in the gameplay, the music, or the characters, hell, not even the story, but in the studio itself for releasing a game in this state. Thank you, everyone, for watching. My name is Mason, also known as the 8-Bit Hypocrite, your local internet moron. If you liked this video, please subscribe, and as always, I'll see you soon.